Good afternoon, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV online. We are, today we have a special speaker. He is not an orthopedic surgeon, but he is one of the best endocrinologists whom I know. And he's, I feel that he's one of the best for us in Mumbai and maybe India. Uh, he's Dr. Manoj Chadda. Uh, he's attached to Hinduja Hospital in Mahim and he has his clinic in Washi. He's going to talk to us on osteoporosis. And this is only one of the talks of the series which we are going to conduct on osteoporosis for the orthopedic surgeon. So over to Dr. Manoj Chad. Thank you, Dr. Vijlani. It's a pleasure to be with uh, friends. Unfortunately, you can't see most of you. And uh, I think osteoporosis and metabolic bone disease is something which is closest to my heart. And I'm really grateful to you all that you gave me a platform to speak to you. Uh, the idea is to, you know, take uh, probably four lectures, uh, say, every week. We'll start today with a little basic course. You may find that you know most of the things, but I promise you, at the end, there will be something which will be new for you. The second uh, lecture will be on something which is, I think, very close to your hearts, and that is calcium and vitamin D. I've been discussing this for the last, I think, two decades with orthopedic surgeons, and the questions have not changed in these two decades. And the third lecture would be on the pharmacotherapy of osteoporosis. And the fourth one we will keep for fragility fractures, fracture license service, and what is new in the pipeline uh, for management of osteoporosis. So let's get into today's talk. Uh, what I plan to do is to give you a break after every, say, 10, 12 minutes. So if there are some burning questions, you can put it up there and then, unless and instead of waiting for that full 30, 40 minutes. Uh, so we also have on the panel with us a senior orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Rajesh Gandhi. He is the uh, past vice president and secretary of Bombay Orthopedic Society. And me and Dr. Rajesh Gandhi are going to be asking sir questions. So you can WhatsApp us. Uh, my link will always be shared with you on Ortho TV. Uh, in the meantime, Dr. Manoj Chadda, can you please share your screen, sir? So is that good? Uh, no, screen sharing has not started yet. Yes, now it has started. Okay. So, like I said, it's uh, a primer because most of the things would you would already know. But uh, there are certain new things that have come up. And uh, the last, like I said, there'll be a surprise in the end of my lecture. Uh, I like to use this ostrich to discuss uh, osteoporosis. So you know this animal, uh, this bird, puts her head into the ground and says that everything is fine around me. So we need to wake up. Uh, I will refrain from referring to the current medical problems that are going around us. But even the issue of osteoporosis, which has uh, been around us for years, we need to wake up and understand that it's a serious problem. It's a big problem. And the most important thing is that it's treatable and preventable to a large extent. So what, besides you know, the discussion that we'll have on what is the definition and how do we go diagnosing and what are the secondary osteoporosis, one of the important discussion that I'm going to have today is how to prevent osteoporosis. Um, it's, I think, customary to define osteoporosis. These are two or three slides uh, to tell you how things have changed from the early 40s and 50s. This is uh, Fuller Albright, Albright's definition. And you should know that Fuller Albright was a father of endocrinology. Everything related to bone metabolism actually comes from his laboratory and has his name. So the, anything related to parathyroid, anything related to bone would be originating from fuller Altrax laboratory. So he described a reduced amount of bone that is quality normal as osteoporotic bone. And to separate it from osteomalacia, 
which is normal amount of bone that is inadequately mineralized. So that's very important uh, to separate these two. Actually, very often in practice, these two occur together. And you'll realize when you discuss treatment that very often the treatment is also the same. Osteomalacia, we would not use the anti-osteoporosis therapy, but uh, a lot of other things are common. As things changed towards the 90s, uh, the definition of osteoporosis uh, became a little more technical and it was said to be a systemic skeletal disorder characterized by low bone mass and microarchitectural deterioration of bone tissue with a consequent increase in bone fragility and susceptibility to fracture. So within the definition, they have talked about a decreased bone mass. They have uh, talked about decreased quality of bone and they've talked about increased susceptibility to fragility fractures. The latest uh, NIH definition of osteoporosis again has basically confirmed the same and said that with decreased bone mass, increased tendency to fracture, and they talk about bone density and bone quality. So bone density is something that can be measured. As of now, bone quality is something that we imagine. There isn't really great investigations for that. The important thing is what is mentioned below, that osteoporosis is a silent disease till a fracture happens then it's a different story. Uh, just to sort of confirm that WHO also talked about uh, uh, the definition of osteoporosis in terms of bone density score. You all know that osteoporosis is a BMD of less than minus 2.5. And osteopenia or decreased bone mass is something between minus one and minus 2.5. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to go into too much detail of bone density although I do have a couple of slides with something interesting. Very often you see something like this and you don't need any investigations, you don't need any definitions. You know that a fragility fracture of the hip or a lumbar compression fracture is equal to osteoporosis. Over years, this young lady is going to age. Now our you know, efforts will not be able to prevent this aging process, but the spine changes that have been depicted in this photograph is something that we can try to prevent at least to a very large extent. And the question that comes up first is how can we prevent osteoporosis? I mean, aging is an ongoing process. There's nothing much you can do to retard aging. But is there something that we can do to reduce the osteoporosis incidence and to reduce eventually the fragility fracture? Because I remember my aunt till 85, 86, thin and frail lady was walking around without any problems. I kept telling her that she had osteoporosis. And she said, I'm fine. So as long as the person has no problems, they're not going to listen to you that osteoporosis is a serious disease. It's only when they fracture, they get worried. Now the question that comes up in front of us as doctors is what can we do to prevent osteoporosis and at what age should we start working? What we can do is, I think we'll be discussing, but at what age is it around menopause? Is it a few years before menopause? Is it in the teens or is it when the child is born? I think this graph that is going to come up here will explain what happens to the bone mass once the child is born, once you age, and once you get into the senile phase. This concept is what is called as the peak bone mass development. So when the child is born, <clears throat> they have certain amount of bone mass from the mother, and that increases really peaking during the period of adolescence, that means between 12 and 20. So the first thing that you need to keep in mind is that they should be, the child should be healthy, active, getting enough of calcium and vitamin D because by the time they reach 25 or so, <clears throat> they reach the peak bone mass. Just like we talk in terms of retirement, 
we talk in terms of in savings and we have to live our old age on our savings in terms of bone the peak bone mass is achieved between 25 and say max 30 in some studies and then after that it is a downhill course so if you want to prevent osteoporosis if you want to prevent fractures at the age of 65 or 75 then you need to have a good peak bone mass a person fracturing at 65 or 70 could fracture because of some problems during this aging process or could also fracture because they never reached the peak bone mass they had an unhealthy childhood they were not eating well they were not playing out in the sun and they ended up with the lower peak bone mass and that is why when they age they start getting so called older or less bone mass earlier so this is the importance of peak bone mass and then for the next say two and a half three decades in males the plateau is maintained whereas females they get pregnant they are lactating they uh, may fall ill in that process they become a little uh, deficient in bone mass as compared to the males after that they are moving towards the perimenopausal age <clears throat> males generally do not have what is called as a menopause or an andropause but in females around perimenopause they start losing anything up to 3 to 4% of their bone mass per year and then towards the third or the fourth year of menopause it becomes about 1 to 2% per year so you can imagine that the transition period of about 5 years a female may end up losing between 8 to 10% of their bone mass once both males and females go towards 65 they enter another phase what is called as a senile phase in which there is age related bone loss i won't give you too much of explanations but the fact remains the one hydroxylation becomes deficient one 25 hydroxy d levels start going down and the bone mass starts going down which is again about 1 to 2% so by the time the patient lives to 85 or 90 their bone mass has really gone down to pre adolescent levels I'm sorry that blue line is not very clear, but I have made this hand drawing for my, uh, myself to explain to you the same concept of going up during adolescence and then peaking around 30 and then consolidating for about 20 years or so, then the female menopausal loss and the male age-related loss. The important thing is I have shown a difference between men and women to emphasize that men are taller, they are heavier, they are more active that way, so their peak bone mass tends to be more than a female's peak bone mass. In addition, uh, because of social uh, conditions, probably the boys are fed better than the girls. I hope I'm wrong now, but that used to be one of the factors, and that's why the male always had an advantage over the female. Then there is no menopause in males, so there, uh, I, I remember as a student 30, 35 years ago, there was nothing like primary male osteoporosis and if we saw osteoporosis in males they had to be a secondary factor that we were asked to look for so this is a very important concept for you all to understand that maintain peak bone mass you will be able to prevent osteoporosis to a large extent what are the factors that influence bone mass which i've just mentioned to you uh, so i think hereditary factors uh, the gender Obviously, nutrition with emphasis on protein, calcium, and vitamin D. Uh, sex steroids, so late, late uh, menarche, late puberty may have a negative influence. And the other hormones that are playing. I think what is most important to stress uh, in schools uh, to mothers is physical activity and maintaining body weight. Smoking, alcohol, other drugs are negative influences on the peak bone mass. So to summarize what happens during the aging process to the bones and why is there a risk of fracture? Uh, starting with the low peak bone mass and then postmenopausal bone loss and age-related bone loss. So all of it together leads to low bone mass and on top of that other risk factors like endocrine disorders, certain medications all contribute to this problem and which can lead to 
fractures in the presence of a fall. It is very rare to have a fracture without a fall. And this is worsened by poor bone quality and in terms of other non-skeletal factors like uh, neurological problems, uh, feeling giddy, muscle weakness. These all contribute to fractures. And that's, I think, in nutshell, why a person fractures in terms of fragility fracture. Now, this is a very interesting slide, I think you all are all familiar with, and you will understand that when the patient is a little younger, so we're talking of, when I say young, we are talking in terms of the perimenopausal or the early menopause age, their defense mechanisms are intact. And so when they trip or fall, they stretch their hand to save themselves. And that's why they end up getting a coalesce fracture. A little older in the senile phase, 65 year old plus, you'll find that they tend to fall down on their butt. And that is why hip fractures start becoming more common. And this is very clearly shown if you look at the uh, incidence of fractures at different ages. The initial part in the first, say, two or three decades are traumatic fractures. And here the males are more prone to traumatic fractures than females for multiple reasons. And then in the aging group, the perimenopausal group, you see that the females start increasing. They start with the lumbar compression fractures. And then once they go into the senile phase, both males and females. So the males have an uh, uprise more after 65, whereas females have it about 50, 55. And that's how the fractures go on increasing. Uh, if there are any questions in relation to peak bone mass, if it is not clear, or if there's some doubt or if there is some other critique on that, probably a minute or two we can spend to answer those questions. Uh, so, sir, I have a question. Yeah. So, these about this peak bone mass that you are saying, is it yeah. genetic? Means basically, if my uh, grandmother was suffering, was, was suffering from her and she eventually died because of a borotic fracture. I'm just giving an example. At the age of, say, 70 or 80. And now my mother is, say, 70 years old. So, what are the chances that she will have that genetic? Means it's 80% is what you are saying? So, that's a fantastic question. The answer is right in the top here. But let mm. me tell you something more. If you say, especially females, that my mother has had a hip fracture or my grandmother had a hip fracture, this is equal to saying that I have a fragility fracture. That much the association is. Okay. So if, if you look at the FRAC score also, in that one of the factors is, do you have a family history of fragility fracture? Specifically, if there is a hip fracture in the mother, that more or less clinches the diagnosis. Okay. That's why that's so important. I have one question. You mentioned about the sex steroids. Now, people, athletes and other people who take uh, steroids and testosterone for the bodybuilding, okay. now their bodies look bloated, their muscles are good, apparently their bones are good. Now, do you think that they will be more susceptible once they stop the testosterone? testosterone, they will be more prone to get osteoporosis at an earlier age? Okay, so there are two parts to it. One is they are taking the androgens now, so their uh, androgen levels are higher, so that's good for the bones at this time. But as things progress, actually they develop hypogonadism, and if they were to stop their treatment, it is like the equivalent of a female menopause. So what I described to you for female menopause will be applicable to these bodybuilders. Oh, so, so uh, we can presume that the fellow has stopped, say, for example, between 35 and 40, he has stopped taking steroids. Then between around 50, he is likely to get a sure. uh, osteoporosis. Yes. So a lot depends upon what is happening to his, his own hypothalamo hypophysial testicular axis. When you're taking steroids or these androgens from outside, your own axis gets suppressed. It is the same thing like taking glucocorticoids. Someone is taking steroids from outside. You're, you're doing well, but your own axis is suppressed. And anytime you stop the steroids or you need some extra steroids under stress, you will not be able to do it. Are there anything like teriparatide, which is given on a daily basis for testosterone, which can be given to keep on stimulating them for the uh, later part? Okay, so there are patches available. 
there are gels available there are tablets available let's okay. not i'm not talking about the sex part i'm talking about the no 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 we are, we are talking of the health part only no the, so there are available in situations where so we have hypogonadal males which we treat we have aging males which we treat with uh, androgens as required uh so coming back to the one more bone mass question related to little bit of genetics yeah. so though uh, see i'll give you a simple example in my family only recently my brother in law's grandfather had a fragility fracture during the covid era i am talking about oh. he did not make it i oh. was not able to operate on him also basically he was medically unfit and eventually he succumbed to a hip fracture fragility fracture though he was very old he was 94 years old almost he was driving a scooter till the age of 80 means so he was actually quite fit but only in the last five few years of his life i think basically the osteoporosis took over i think and he had lost his balance and basically everything was there so that you are saying that if he has at 94 also if he has a fragility fracture the chances of his sons who are now 70 plus are having a fragility fracture is high so i think uh, my statement was that if your mother has had a fragility acha okay yeah it was mother sorry yeah that that is the very strong history okay see a 94 year old uh you know is likely to have osteoporosis right. okay and then if you say they they are giddy or their their neurological balance is not there their muscles start getting weaker see that is why today bone and muscle sarcopenia is as important as osteoporosis if you want to talk in terms of yes. preventing osteoporosis mm. yeah. weight bearing exercise very important along with diet so probably that we'll discuss next time Okay, okay, so sorry. coming back to my yeah. slides. Okay, sorry, sir. Yeah. No, no. If this, uh, because again, these will. I mean, these questions and topics are all interrelated. Right. So, risk factors for low bone mass. Uh, you know, if you uh, talk in terms of, it's actually loss of height or probably not getting that. So that's why the Caucasians, because they are taller than us, their peak bone mass is better than us. Their low body weight, uh, advanced age. I explained to you how with time. Uh, bone mass is going to go down late age at menarche and early menopause so if the reproductive age is smaller that you know less say normally an average is 12 to 50 if the lady gets menarche at 14 15 and gets menopause by 40 or 38 then their reproductive age is less so the estrogen protective action goes away the years past menopause again obviously but i think what is treatable and what we really need to emphasize smoking you know so often in diabetes uh, i tell them smoking is bad for health everyone knows smoking is bad for health in terms of cancer heart disease lung disease but the other things which we need to emphasize like for example here we are discussing bone so smoking is, uh, is a bone toxin alcohol uh, beyond the permissible limits is a bone toxin if you have got a calcium deficient diet your bone mass is going to go low medications like steroids uh, thyroid medications these are all uh, bone toxins uh, then inflammatory diseases uh, affect the bone like uh, your collagen vascular disease rheumatoid arthritis and like i said a history of prior fragility fracture adds to your problems when we discuss the fragility fractures and fracture lies in service probably we'll discuss uh, this last statement a little more in detail so what i just showed you was factors for low bone mass now what i want to discuss is risk factors for osteoporotic fractures so they are not the same they appear to be the same because if your bone mass is low your risk for osteoporotic fractures increases but beyond that what has been mentioned in this slide like advancing age prior fragility fracture family history of osteoporosis in a first degree relative uh, again not very clearly mentioned here but it's the hip fracture which is very important for us current smoker low body weight repeated falls sarcopenia dementia so these are all factors which will increase the risk of osteoporotic fracture so i remember you know when you were to uh, sort of explain or classify osteoporosis there used to be something called primary osteoporosis which is either post menopausal or senile or juvenile that means what can happen even in the children today we won't go into the problems of osteoporosis in children because that is again a very separate uh, 
chapter and problem which is not managed by most of us they are specialists for that but what we are interested is beyond the primary osteoporosis you could have contributory factors like endocrine disorders so thyroid disorders cushing syndrome hypogonadism hyperprolactinemia acromegaly i mean most endocrine disorders are actually an insult to the bone and that's where you must clinically at least have a look you can't keep doing all the endocrine investigations in every patient of osteoporosis but someone is coming early uh, it doesn't fit into the normal pattern someone has had uh, you know very low bone density someone has discordance in their bmd values i'll give you one or two examples you must think of endocrine disorders so regular investigations if you see in terms of biochemistry a complete blood count uh, anemia malnutrition could be again contributory to reduce bone mass calcium is a must which should be corrected for albumin so just to sort of revise you can ask your lab to do what is called as ionic calcium which is very specific but most labs don't have ionic calcium so we do a total calcium now calcium exists bound to proteins albumin uh, binding globulin and free so we correct for the uh, albumin levels because if our patient is low albumin the calcium levels tend to be low so what we do is we take an average of albumin as 4 and if the cal- albumin is instead of 4 only 3 and your calcium report comes as 8.5 then for every decrease of gram of albumin you need to multiply by 0.8 that means you increase your serum calcium by 0.8 so in other words your report is 8 mg percent and your albumin is 3 then 4 minus 3 is 1 and you multiply 1 by 0.8 and that you add to the serum calcium if the albumin is 3.5 then it will be 0.5 into 0.8 that is 0.4 and that you will add to the serum calcium so that is called corrected calcium renal problems again very common cause for decrease in bone mass so you must look at the serum creatinine and preferably through an app calculate the egfr alkaline phosphatase is a useful investigation tell you that there is something going wrong and generally alkaline phosphatase is connected with osteomalacia thyroid disorders are so common and it's a part of routine investigation now so if not more than uh, other investigation but at least a tsh can be done in the elderly patients especially males you must look for multiple myeloma so benz jones proteins or serum electrophoresis is a useful investigation in our country iatrogenic cushings that means doctors vaid hakim homeopaths giving steroids to patients knowingly unknowingly lead to what is called as iatrogenic cushings and osteoporosis if you have a patient of cushing syndrome you generally have high levels of cortisol but if you have a patient of iatrogenic cushing someone has been giving him steroids from outside the serum cortisol will be very very low hardly detectable so that gives you an idea that this patient is taking uh, steroids from outside 25 hydroxy d uh, i think today if i were to start a laboratory i could run my laboratory only on tsh and 25 hydroxy d because Uh, and sugar probably because everyone asks this investigation in every patient so it's a, a useful investigation sometimes but more often than not uh, we are just documenting the fact that the patient is vitamin d deficient and studies across india from north from south from west have confirmed that a large population percentage of our population are actually vitamin d deficient uh a- anything regarding the investigations if someone is uh, so i yeah i think i need to add here a pth also in some invest, uh, patients because especially when you're thinking on using anabolic therapy then you must document that the pth is normal before you get into therapy you know i have seen occasionally uh, patients having been prescribed teriparatide and when you follow them up their serum calcium is 12 12.5 their pth is elevated these patients actually have primary hyperparathyroidism and osteoporosis and we are treating them with teriparatide so sometimes 
these basic investigations can help prevent major blunders in choice of therapy you mean to say in all the people who are to be put on a therapy drug we need to do the pth levels we must do a serum calcium okay and we preferably should do a pth okay. because you, if your pth is high because of secondary problems that means vitamin d deficiency you need to correct that first and if your pth is high because of renal diseases then probably you will not be able to use teriferatide i mean when the pth is already high what is the idea of giving pth again from outside so that's why it makes sense to check up the pth if you are keen to go in for teriferatide therapy Uh, can you uh, see as orthopedic surgeons who are not working in corporate setups mm. where we routinely do not get the eGFR can you just uh, elaborate about yeah. the eGFR a little no, bit no no so it's very simple you get apps on the store for okay. eGFR all you need is the age the sex the weight and the serum grade that's it okay. that's it it's according to the weight yeah so it so that is why a 90 kilo person Hmm. and a 45 kilo person with a serum creatinine of 1 don't mean the same thing okay okay so we have to stop looking at serum creatinine and saying yes ab theek hai hmm. no it's not like that and you have as an app it's very simple i mean you get apps on that we do either the epi formula or the mdrd formula and it's that easy to use it, it doesn't take more than 30 seconds So we have a question from a delegate who's watching on Ortho TV. His name is Dr. Tej Chandani. Yeah. He is asking, when do you do vitamin D test and not 25 hydroxy vitamin D? Okay, that's a good question. So when we say vitamin D, we are referring to 25 hydroxy D for all practical purposes. When we want 125 hydroxy D, then we need to specify that active metabolite. It costs. maybe 2 to 3 times what vitamin d costs or 25 hydroxy d costs and it's a useless investigation in a setting of what we are talking today of osteoporosis you need to do vitamin d which is the same thing we are saying doing 25 hydroxy d as is mentioned on this slide so the 125 hydroxy d has to be done only in very specific situations which most of the times does not apply to an orthopedic surgeon exactly that's why i'm not talking i, mean, I see sometimes what happens is you all catch on to some rare things and uh, start doing those which is not really good so about the calcium corrected for albumin can you just explain once more basically i was not able to get that exactly what it is, it is oh no no so that's very important so you know serum calcium uh, is let's say half of it is free and half mm. of it is bound to proteins okay. and the major protein is albumin now imagine there is a person whose serum albumin is 2 g per cent so normal is 4 here mm -hmm. this person has only 2 g per cent mm -hmm. whether it is malnutrition or renal disease or whatever now you do a total serum calcium his report is 7.5 mm -hmm. uh you know 7.5 mg per cent what do we tell the person now the the pathology lab says normal is 8.5 to 10.5 right so this patient will say but mera to 7.5 hai that means i am abnormal i need to do something about this but when you look at his serum albumin instead of 4 it is 2 so i said for every gram reduction of serum albumin you need to increase calcium by 0.8 okay. that's called corrected so here instead of 4 his is albumin is only 2 2 so 4 minus 2 is 2 2 2 into 0.8 is 1.6 So seven plus one point six, his corrected calcium is eight point six. Okay. Yeah. So that's the way. You, it's a very simple thing. Corrected calcium. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, I mean, ionic calcium again adds to your cost by six eight hundred rupees, okay. and it's not available everywhere. That's the whole thing. Okay. So Other comorbidities do they affect as much as the multiple myeloma? Sorry, I missed the early part. Other gamma glomerulopathies. Yeah. apart from multiple myelomas so do they have a same impact uh, i i'm not too sure if i have the right answer but we generally are referring to uh, so nowadays multiple myeloma also has got so many uh, you know uh, manifestations uh, heavy chain light chain so yeah. they do affect uh, the calcium part and they do affect the bone also 
Okay. So let's go ahead. Uh, yes, sir, sure. When we are screening for osteoporosis, you know, so uh, we've been told that if there is a fragility fracture, that is equal to osteoporosis. But when you want to do a BMD, because you want to document, so, you know, you need something to fall back on after three years or five years or 10 years of follow-up. So BMD today is the best what is available. It may not be the best in terms of predicting risk and things like that, but it's best what is available today. And I think uh, most guidelines uh, recommend doing a BMD in the aging population. So whether it is 65 years or 70 years. Question is, when would you do BMD earlier? And here, I think you see a list of those between 50 and 64. Um, fragility fractures uh, after 40, parental hip fracture, medications which cause bone loss like steroids, um, alcoholics, smoking, um, the collagen vascular disorders, um, people who are you know really losing weight, then you would think of looking at the uh, bone mass. Uh, bone density. And again, below 50 also, it has to be very selective. See, uh, what I want to point out, the reason I put this slide here was not to tell you all when to do it. Actually, I want to tell you when not to do it. In corporate hospitals, uh, including uh, Hinduja Hospital, a lot of packages contain BMD as a part of their investigation without applying any sense or you know applying their brain to it while making those packages. We see patients who are 30 years old, 35 year old, coming with low BMD. And one of our colleagues has you know, very efficiently started some therapy for osteoporosis without realizing that the commonest cause for reduced BMD in a 35 year old is osteomalacia and not osteoporosis. So please remember, don't ask indiscriminately for BMD because sometimes you know, investigations can backfire. I've had uh, people saying, oh, but my company pays for it and it's done as a package. Yeah, I'm not saying whether it is free or you are paying for it. It is going to cause problems if you fall in the wrong hand and uh, without taking names, there are colleagues who you know, start therapy, one, sometimes two anti-osteoporosis therapy in patients who are just 30, 35 with backache. Remember I told you in the beginning, Osteoporosis is a silent disease until you fracture. So backache is not a common presentation of osteoporosis. Please remember that. See, this is another interesting statement. You know, we see so many X-ray uh, chests. We see means radiologist report. And we see so many uh, lateral plates. So this is an interesting study that in a busy hospital, when the radiologists were made to review their reports, 15 to 25 percent had actually missed out a collapse, whatever. So, lateral x rays sometimes can give a lot of interesting information, uh, which we would otherwise would have been missed out. I'm not going to give you too many studies, but this is one interesting study because sometime back I made a statement that BMD is the best tool available today to diagnose osteoporosis. But if you look at this study, uh, which was done way back in 2000, they have looked at, so you can understand this bell graph tells you the uh, standard di uh, distribution. So they looked at, uh, you know, the number of fractures that were expected based on our definition of osteoporosis. So anything less than minus 2.5 is osteoporosis. So you expect maximum number of fractures to happen with a T-score of min, my, less than minus 2.5. But what this study found instead was that the maximum number of fractures were occurring between minus 1 to minus 2. That means more in the osteopenic uh, range. So very often we have this argument that why don't you start treatment at minus 1? Why do you wait for minus 2.5? The reason is the maximum fracture rate is in these mi below minus 2.5. And uh, we'll get into this a little more details when we uh, talk in terms of starting treatment. 
But the important point I want to make here is that fracture, fragility fractures can happen at any T-score. So BMD is only one of the contributory factors to fragility fractures. There is uh, the quality of bone, then there are other disease processes, like I talk about low peak bone mass. So that is why the number of fractures that happen earlier are much more, but the incidence of fractures in, in terms of percentage will be in the when the BMD has become less. Uh, I said I'm not going to go into uh, BMD because that's another full chapter. But one, as I mentioned, when you should ask for a BMD. And the second question that comes up often is why do we need to measure spine and hip and the forearm also in some centers? Actually, uh, it should be that you just do the hip and leave it because we keep uh, emphasizing that that's the most dangerous part. If it fractures, you have the highest morbidity and mortality, etc. Or we could do only the spine. So the reason why we do both, you know, is uh, mentioned here, but I want to uh, give a little importance to this first statement. Diagnosis is based on the lowest BMD site. You know, sometimes the person reporting writes osteopenia at the hip and osteoporosis at the lumbar spine or vice versa. Please note, you can't have two diagnoses like that. A chain is as strong as the weakest link. So if there is osteoporosis, if there's low BMD on one site, then you have osteoporosis, period. You don't report it separately. Now, why we have this discordance, if you remember the uh, bone loss I was talking about. So the postmenopausal bone loss is actually cancellous bone. So that's maximum losses in the lumbar vertebra. Whereas with aging, it's going to be cortical bone loss and there the bone loss is more at the hip. Then there are certain drugs like steroids. They cause maximum bone loss at the lumbar spine. Whereas conditions like hyperparathyroidism, they cause maximum bone loss at the cortical bone. So you'll have decreased BMD in the hip. So whenever you have such a discordance in the hip and the spine, besides the aging process, you must always think of some other secondary factors. Uh, I think another question that comes up often in, during discussion when looking at the BMD reports is the spine is osteopenia, the hip is osteopenia, and the forearm is given as minus 3.5, minus 4, and, you know, very poor sports. And then someone says, oh, this is a very serious situation and we need to start treatment. When the hip and the spine are readable, there are no deformities, no fractures, no implants, you do not look at the forearm. The forearm has to be used only in conditions where you cannot read the spine and the hip or in rare situations of severe primary hyperparathyroidism or when the patient is so heavy, more than 150 kilos that he can't get onto the machine. Otherwise, don't base your decisions on the forearm BMD reports. Okay, so any response, doubts, questions to what I just talked about BMD? Yeah, okay. Uh, I remember in one of the virals, you had mentioned about the disparity in the spine and the hip joint, the BMD disparity. Yeah. Probably because of the osteoarthritis or the spondylosis of the spine, where there are osteophytes and the sclerosis. So, so, so that, that is... Does give rise okay. to a better BMD. So, so how, how do you avoid that? Okay, so that's yeah. So what you're talking of is artifacts, osteophytes there, uh, you know things like that. So there are two ways of doing it. One is what is called as a lateral view. You can do a lateral BMD. Uh, most machines actually can do it if they, there's a software for that. Or you may sometimes see a calcified iota in front of the uh, lumbar spine. Then it becomes very difficult to interpret that report. So. Before, you know, when you see a BMD report, it says this image is not for diagnostic purpose. Please ignore that statement. Look at that image and what you just mentioned, you will be able to make out sometimes a compression when the BMD suddenly becomes high in one lumbar vertebrae. You will be able to make up a calcified iota. You are seeing an 80-year-old lady with excellent BMD report. 
please suspect that there is something wrong or get an lateral x ray done of the lumbar spine you'll get a lot of answers uh, now ct bmd how it is better than or is it better or if it is how it is better than the normal bmd okay that's a very complicated question i'll give you in two or three short answers yeah qct is better than the bmd that we are doing full stop now why we don't do it number one the radiation that is involved with the qct as compared to bmd is you know let's say nearly 100 times oh you see that's large a bmd radiation is less than a 4 hour flight that you take when you take a flight for 4 hours or more the radiation from bmd is less that air uh, that flight radiation is more secondly the qct actually can be done with a regular ct scanner all you need is a software but up till now the qct talk looked at only the lumbar spine it could not do the hip qct now the newer machines are talking about hip also the reason why i said it is actually better is because it is looking at the volume of the bone whereas when we are doing bmd we are looking at the area of the bone so uh, i mean uh, probably towards the last session we can have a little more technical discussion i'll uh, i will be happy to discuss that why volume is better than area i have good slides to show you uh, so keep that as a question and if you make that set of faqs uh, set of questions for me towards the last session i'll definitely take it up definitely okay sure. so there is one question from the delegate a uh, lot of camps are held where they do heel scanning for bmd does it relate to spine and vertebra bmd there is two types of camps which i have seen one is the heel and one is the proximal tibia okay the upper end tibia so do they so, have any difference any significance so the ultrasound that you are they are doing in the camps as a technique is reasonably good the way it is done by any tom dick and harry it's a useless investigation it causes more problems it it only increases your workload if you if i may say so yes you are right you know so bmd is is by itself a very specific technique to be done by trained technicians so we generally tell our patients go to the same machine in the same center and prefer the same technician these camps really uh, i think there are other uh, reasons beyond it just be, uh, uh, it's not the scanning or the screening that we are doing there are other reasons for the camps okay so uh, towards the now coming to three or four specific things which i mentioned uh, we have you know uh, going towards the end of my talk now so the last 10 minutes probably uh, bone markers is something which is very underrepresented in our investigations i did not talk about bone markers as a diagnostic tool so i am beginning by saying you do not use bone markers for diagnosis of osteoporosis so then what is the use of bone markers so bone markers basically are degradation products from collagen so you've got the bone formation markers and the bone resorption markers and as the bone turnovers these markers also increase or decrease so they basically reflect the activity of the bone and that is why you cannot use it as a diagnosis of osteoporosis because there we are looking at the bone mass so the common markers that are used for formation for us it's either bone specific alkaline phosphatase osteocalcin is hardly available probably what is most popular today is the amino terminal propeptide of type 1 pro collagen also called p1np and the resorption markers also there are multiple in the urine at the serum i think what is important if it's available uh, not in india is the serum uh, ntx or ctx what is available is the urinary ntx or ctx so whichever your lab can do regularly for you uh, i think most of the commercial labs are doing urinary ctx and that's a good way of telling you so this is resorption and what i showed you earlier was the formation marker so these become important tools for following up your patients you know a bmd i i didn't mention this but you don't ask for a bmd 
every few months or six months or one year. If you're using a bone formation agent like teriparatide, then probably nine months to 12 months. But if you're doing a bone resorption, I mean, anti-resorptive therapy, then it should be 18 to 24 months before you ask for a repeat BMD. Okay, uh, bone markers are pretty good in terms of giving us information of what is happening. The problem is that there is a lot of variability. When we started looking at bone markers about a decade ago, we used to say that there is 50% variation possible. That means if a pathology lab gives me a report of 100, the range could be actually between 50 to 150. So you can understand how unreliable these markers were to begin with. So unless there was a 50% change, you could not say that there is actually a decrease or an increase. It could be just be a lab error also. So the variability now fortunately has come down because of computerization to 30% for urine markers and nearly 10% for serum markers. So that's the good part that has come on. They have become more precise. The other thing about bone markers you must remember quickly is you need to measure them early morning. Diet interferes with the markers, so you need to do it on an empty stomach. And getting up from sleep uh, is important. Immobilization increases turn turnover. Fractures can increase bone markers. Uh, they've described seasonal changes, menstrual changes, age changes. So there are factors that can make changes in bone markers. But I think for us as clinicians, early morning fasting sample is what we need to remember. And recent fractures will interfere with your bone marker reports. And uh, again, a list of diseases which will affect the bone turnover and hence will affect the bone marker. So you need to know the endocrine disorders that can interfere with bone markers. Okay, so we'll skip this slide. And as I mentioned, uh, serum markers today with the automated techniques are about 10% variation and urinary markers about 30% variation. So if you are to compare it with an earlier report, unless the difference is more than what is mentioned here, don't react to the reports. I mentioned about the early morning sample and the urine could be a first or a second morning uh, urine void. And their potential use is really to monitor the effectiveness of therapy because especially when you're using bone formation agents which are very expensive, you're taking your patient every day injection, you can't tell them, I'll tell you after one year whether you're doing well or not. So six weeks, 12 weeks, three months, uh, six months, you can do this formation markers and tell that things are improving. And similarly, you can use resorption markers with anti-resorptive agents, and it can also predict the fracture risk to some extent. The last two parts now. I said I'm going to give you something new and interesting. Now don't get worried about my slide. I'm not going to talk to you about diabetes or make you all diabetologists. Although there's no harm. The amount of diabetes that is there in the world, I think, Every doctor should know and manage diabetes to some extent. What I've said here is what are the complications of diabetes? You see uh, macrovascular complications, the eye, the kidney, the heart, the nerves, the macrovascular complications, the infections. Do you see anything of your interest here? Not really. Then why am I talking to you about diabetes? We just spent the last 35, 40 minutes on uh, risk factor for osteoporosis. And uh, I mean, you can go through it in the next 15 seconds. I'm not going to read it out again for you. you. You are now very well aware of what are the risk factors for osteoporosis. So what is the relation between the first slide and the second slide? Really nothing. Because in this risk factor for osteoporosis, there is no mention of diabetes. And in the complication of diabetes, there is no mention of osteoporosis. The reason I'm bringing this up to you maybe as a new topic or maybe you've heard it somewhere else recently, is now we have started looking at diabetes as a major contributory factor to osteoporosis. You have so much of diabetes in the world and specifically so much of diabetes in India. It starts at an earlier age. It leads to complications at an earlier age. And we know from epidemiological studies that diabetes is associated with increased risk of fragility fractures. So, what I'm introducing to you today is a concept that when you see a diabetic patient in your practice and you see a BMD score, 
you actually need to increase the risk by 50%. So what you would do for a minus 2.5, for a diabetic probably at minus 1.5 or minus 1.8, you need to react. So the risk increases again, just as I said, we can keep this topic if you all are interested uh, for another day. But I want you all to think about diabetes when you see osteoporosis. And when you see a diabetic, if you do see one, think about osteoporosis. And now the last part. How many of you have seen a fragility fracture in a 31-year-old female who has delivered in the last, say, three to six months? I'm going to pause for maybe a minute or even more if I can get some people, someone in this crowd can say that they are, yes, we have seen one patient. I don't think we have seen. Okay. I have not seen any. Any. So you are, I mean, what I'm trying to say is you are not in the minority. You are the majority because this is a rare problem which is not thought about. But when we look at the mechanism, what surprises us is that why don't we see it so more often? After all, uh, let me tell you the story and then we'll go to this. So this is, I, I have seen in my 30 odd years about three patients. And when I looked up the literature, big names have talked about five patients, nine patients. I think the largest series is about 11 patients. So you can imagine where we talk in terms of tens of thousands of patients. Here we are talking of series of five, seven and nine patients. Now, after today's talk, probably if you can get Bombay Orthopedics, uh, members to think about this disorder, we may have a large series for Mumbai itself. So this was a 31-year-old female. Uh, she delivered a couple of months ago, three months ago. Uh, breastfeeding came with backache, continues and increased by movements. It is actually, I think this patient was one of our good friends. I am not naming him here, but uh, he's one of our good uh, Bombay orthopedic spine surgeons. Uh, Medical history, she was hypothyroid on treatment, not a big deal. Pre-pregnancy, menses were normal, no chronic illness, no family history. And medication-wise also, she had just received her regular supplements. Height was 157, BMI was 23, absolutely normal. General examination, unremarkable, clinically euthyroid. She had tenderness on palpation of the lower back, but no neuro deficit. Hemoglobin, creatinine, sodium, potassium, AST, fasting, PP, A1C, TSH, all normal. You look on the other side, alkaline phosphatase was elevated. 25 hydroxy D was only 4.37. PTH was not elevated, which is surprising. Calcium adjusted was 8.6, just above normal. I mean, just at the upper limit of, uh, lower limit of normal. And phosphorus was 3.3. I guess you guys are better at reading the MRI, but for me, the report is compression and wedging of D9, D11, D12, and L1. Uh, I'm sure you would be happier to have the plates in your hand, but the point is that a otherwise normal 31-year-old postpartum lady has come with severe backache, tenderness on examination, and with this MRI. So again, I'm asking you this question. Have you all seen post-pregnancy such patients. And if you have not seen, probably it was there one case in 25 years and might have been missed out. So now I want you to think about this in future that, okay, we did have this discussion. Let me ask. Uh, see, first of all, pregnant ladies will not come to you and postpartum they'll also not come to you. But when you see a backache after postpartum, please think about this disorder. Uh, her BMDs to start with were minus three uh, T-score and femur was minus 1.6. And she was treated with oral calcium, vitamin D. We didn't give her anything uh, in terms of anti disorder which is again a different chapter. Let's not go into it. But this condition is what is called as pregnancy and lactation induced osteoporosis. It may not be there in your textbook because it is comparatively new and it's a rare condition. But now if you ask endocrinologists, each one of us probably has seen one case or two case in a lifespan of about 25, 30 years. One year down the line, you can see BMD has gone up by 3.6% and the femur by 2.2%. So although 
minus 3 has become minus 2.7. I mean, she is still uh, in the osteoporotic range, but she has improved considerably just with calcium and vitamin D. One of the controversies is how to treat it, uh, whether we give teriparatide, whether we give anti resorptive whether we give denosumab, do we allow lactation? These are the controversies which you don't need to worry about. But this is a disorder that you must think about next time you see a postpartum lady. It is not a myth. I have shown you one. I have got three patients. I can show the x-rays to you. And uh, like I said, this is, this is amongst your colleagues only. Although I think one is from Rajkot and one is from Pune. So friends, uh, I have, I think, come to the end of my slides. I have defined osteoporosis for you. I have talked about the risk factors with a lot of emphasis on peak bone mass. So if you want to prevent osteoporosis, please don't look at 50, 60 year olds. Look at three, four, five, 10 year old uh, in your children's classmates, your, your grandchildren's classmates. Those are the ones that need to be treated. The risk factors are when known, but we need to think about it. Suspect secondary causes where you know the BMD scores are not matching with what you are expecting. There's discordance or if you're having fragility fracture at an early age. Uh, I think uh, bone markers is something which is not being used regularly, but should become, uh, I think, being asked for more commonly uh, as a follow-up tool. It is not to be used as a diagnostic tool. Um, I have introduced two new things to you. Hopefully, you will follow it up seriously. One is diabetes and osteoporosis. And the second is pregnancy-induced uh, so, uh, and lactation-associated osteoporosis. So I'm going to stop now and uh, I'll be happy to take up any more questions. Okay. Now, one thing about the diabetes-induced osteoporosis or diabetes-associated osteoporosis, is it because of the sarcopenia, which they get a lot of, a lot, most of the diabetics have a lot of muscle mass loss. So is it because of that or is it some other phenomenon or other mechanism is involved? So there are more than one reason. What you mentioned is an important reason which is for any, I said, uh, it's not only bone mass, even muscle mass is important. And uh, if, okay. for those who are from GS Medical College in KM Hospital, will remember Dr. Manu Khatari always used to say that the skeleton is very, I mean, the muscle mass is very important to protect the skeleton and not the other way around. So, yes, diabetes has uh, bone loss, has uh, quality problems, muscle problems, neurological problems, so they tend to fall more. Uh, but let me tell you an interesting thing is type 1 diabetics have low BMD. But type 2 diabetics actually may have normal or even increased BMD and still their fracture risk is more than two times. Okay. And uh, sir, I, I have... No, you go no, ahead. Sorry, finish it off. Finish off. Any particular reason? Particular reason in diabetes? Yeah, you told about type 1 and type 2, difference in type 1 and type yeah. 2. So, there are multiple reasons. One, like if you know, a type 1 is always thinner, uh, lighter. So, you mentioned about Actually. sarcopenia, but the BMD is low. They've got a, a low IGF-1, which again uh, is a, actually an anabolic hormone. So, they're more likely to fracture. Whereas type 2, there are other quality issues and they've got complications. So, they tend to fall more. So, it's, it's a separate chapter and they're things which we are also learning with time now. Yeah, we have been seeing a decent number of uh, backaches in the later part of the pregnancy. And fair number of time, we don't even take the x-rays because of the, because they are going to deliver. Exactly. So, you so can't the, do that. By the time they deliver, they are okay. Now, is it that the, these are the patients possibly had a uh, osteomalacic uh, involvement and they have recovered over the time because of the people. We do load them with vitamin D3 and calcium and everything. So, during pregnancy, I, I purposely didn't show you those slides. I actually have a full talk on this uh, pregnancy lactation induced osteoporosis. During pregnancy, the need for calcium increases tremendously, especially in the third trimester. So, what you just said, third trimester backache, that could be a contributory factor. And osteomalacia, vitamin D deficiency is a big problem. Fortunately, our gynex have now also started using vitamin D through the pregnancy. Our interest or our you know, point of focus is after delivery, if they still have backache, then you please look for compression fractures. Uh, we, I, 
Yeah. Sorry. Please Sorry. go. Okay. So I'll continue with this question. So I had one patient like this. Uh, she was, uh, I think, multi para, and uh, she had already three, four children. And I think it was a fourth or fifth child. I don't remember exactly. And she came. She was uh, referred to me by the gynecologist post delivery, and uh, two, three days back, and she was unable to walk. so and that place did not have a digital x-ray this is almost 10 years back that place did not have a digital x-ray and uh, she i got the x-rays done but they were not so great quality because of her weight and everything and i thought that what why is the cause of pain let's do vitamin d3 i kept on treating her and eventually when i did a ct scan i came to know that she had a neck femur oops pathological yeah. neck femur which was an in luckily an incomplete fracture because she was on the bed all the time she was not able to walk only yeah. so that was a very uh, important so learning factor for me also Yeah, so if you can track that out now, it will be very interesting. Hmm. So yeah. she comes to me still, still comes. But yeah, if you can get those, yeah. I, I would be really keen to get that. Hmm. Let me make a very interesting and you know a, a remark which would probably go against what you all have learned all these years. So pregnancy and lactation is a big insult to the women's skeleton because a lot of calcium is transferred to the fetus and the child. now what i am going to tell you something very interesting you know sarkar and general common sense says that you should space pregnancies 2 to 3 years after lactation if you give them one years time the bone again gets back to its original shape in other words there are remarks in our textbook which say that you have pregnancy lactation gap of 2 3 years again pregnancy lactation where actually your bone turns o- turns over and it becomes younger so what we used to say there are not so many pregnancies is bad for the bone may not really be bad it's only question is there should be an adequate time for the bones to recover yeah basically there was a gap between the children was very less it was it was i think less than one and a half year maybe she had not finished lactation and she had become pregnant again something so like that the only form of contraception was lactation yes so this uh, so this now i want to understand when you said osteoporosis in pregnancy and lactation how do we differentiate whether this is an osteoporosis or an osteomalacia or simple just vitamin d deficiency which is causing or calcium deficiency which is causing these issues so all that has been really discussed ah. but you will not get that mri which i showed you right or that fra- uh, fracture ah. uh, incomplete fracture of the femur neck in osteomalacia okay so in osteomalacia that may not happen yeah. but in younger females that i have noticed in the last few years when i became more aware after i started listening to your lectures that uh, younger females who come to me were menarchy that is 16 years 18 years old mm-hmm. and who recently started uh, wearing a uh, proper clothes and they have sunlight exposure is reduced they start getting these tibial shin pains leg pains and i have noticed in at least one or two cases in a year every year that i am seeing that they are having stress fractures either in the oh, toes so yeah so toes is not considered as fragility fracture toes nahi sorry a metatarsal 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 again and tibia ha tibia mein hai so there these especially the athletes you see they get these stress fractures yes foot fractures the metatarsal in the toes are not counted in fragility fracture okay so uh, there i think you are talking okay. of uh, deficiency and stress fractures what about proximal tibia or middle tibia no that is that has to be considered as fragility so we used to talk we used to talk about femur also so i have seen in femur also we used to talk about femur there are two types of fractures one is the loser zones yeah, no, or so insufficiency those, fractures yeah. so those are insufficiency they are fractures but they are not really fractures they are pseudo fractures okay so you should rule out the insufficiency fracture and not call them as fractures so they are not osteoporotic they are not osteoporotic they are more of osteomalacia Malaysia. vitamin d deficiency mainly yeah correct calcium and vitamin d deficiency mainly when we are on this topic we discussed and you told that we will discuss it later on about the bone volume and bone mass okay so no bmd i i i probably next time i will start with that because i need two three slides to describe it or i need a uh, okay. whiteboard and all that to explain to you so i will note it down uh, okay, okay. We, whenever we are meeting uh, next time uh, yeah. if this time is good then i think i, I, I think like this time is good tuesdays on 3 to 5 pm we should keep it as a series for the full month Please. okay so i promise yeah, so tuesday ko rakhte hain next tuesday wapas karenge we will start with okay. this question why hmm. volume is better than area hmm. and then yeah. we'll go on to the hot 
vitamin D and calcium top. Oh yeah, yeah. For that, I think there will be lots of yeah. queries on that for everybody. No, no, no. Yeah, so I will speak for twenty minutes, hmm. and I'll leave the forty minutes with you. Hmm. Sure, I think that will be better. That'll be better. Okay. So I think let me have a look at my phone once to see if there are any more questions. If not, there are no more, then we can call it a day. Yeah. Okay. So I think we are done with all the questions from the delegates. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you sir. Much. And we will Thank see you, you next week, Tuesday, in continuation of the osteoporosis series. So all of you are watching, you can see the recorded webinar. If you have missed any part of it, immediately as soon as we end this. And for others who are basically seeing the complete webinar, they can continue the part two, which will come next Tuesday, same time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Manoj Chadda. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh Gandhi. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. Thank you.